Okay, so it's basically time. Let's get started. Um, uh, today, we're very happy to have Dr. Eugenio Colosillo here with us. Um, he received a PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from Johns Hopkins University in 2004. He's currently an associate professor of the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering, the School of Mechanical Engineering, and of Psychological Sciences in the College of Health and Human Sciences at Purdue University, where he directs the ELAP laboratory. Um, his, research focuses, uh, his research focus is in computer artificial vision systems, deep learning, hardware acceleration of vision algorithms, and his research interests include analog and mixed mode integrated circuits for biomedical instru instrumentation, synthetic, vi vi synthetic vision, value inspired sensory systems and networks, biological sensors, silicon uh, insulator design. So let's welcome Dr. Cruzillo to give us a talk today on deep learning in practice. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, thank, thanks for having me. Thank you, Justin, for the introduction. Uh, and I'm, I'm mostly here today uh, to, to meet friends, <laughs> to, to build up some collaboration, uh, because we are in biomedical department principally, and um, we wanted to build some collaboration with uh, computer science, uh, uh, people that are interested in this area, you know, both um, we have uh, we have a lab here, so both on research, but we also st uh, recently started a company. So we're always looking for talent or people that might be interested. So, um, so let me start. Um, so first of all, uh, deep learning. I've, I've been working in deep learning for more than ten years. So it's because before it was it was popular, <laughs> basically. And um, I know Jan LeCun came here. I actually learned some of the things from from Jan. More than ten years ago, you know, he kind of started me up. <laughs> but I, we had an interest even before I met Jan in uh, in uh, neuro neuromorphic or bio inspired uh, computation. In particular, I was always interested in artificial vision. You know, how can how can we understand visually all the great things that we can understand? You know, in our daily life. So that was really sort of my long term goal is to try to <laughs> replicate uh, vision in um, in machines. Um, but first, I have to uh, thank the team. So some of the guys are here. Um, um, they, you know, they obviously helped immensely in doing mo most of the work, and uh, I'm very grateful to be working with them. Um, so yeah, so you know, sort of our mission, both in um, in in research, but uh, in, in the company, is really to in introduce complex visual capabilities in uh, in computer and appliances, um, and it doesn't necessarily stop at visual capabilities. That's just one thing that we really spend a lot of time on. But um, uh, we also, you know, can use or would like to use and maybe will use uh, other forms of data like voice and so forth, uh, text. Um, so yeah, a lot of our research is a, is a combination of, uh, um, you know, different, different areas. So it's sort of in between electrical engineering, which is my background, and uh, in neuroscience, which I learned, you know, early on in my career, um, talking about vision learning and neural networks, and um, and then computer science, which you know, you guys are the expert, but I'm trying to learn on a daily basis <laughs> new things about. <laughs> um, so you probably, you know, you probably heard of deep learning. Um, what it is is, um, I mean, it's been really popular recently. There's uh, some some very notable people that have been acquired by internet giants. In fact, most of my friends, uh, some friends are you know are a Google brain. They've been there for ten years. You know, well, not ten years, but you know, five or six years. Uh, Jan was uh, sucked in by <laughs> Facebook. Uh, uh, my our other friend Clement was bought by by Twitter and so forth. So they they really affecting all the talent. So that's why you hear a lot about it. Uh, there's also been lots of uh, you know, acquisition by companies and, and so forth. And you also hear it in, in, in academic setting. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit, in, introduce you to the topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll pre, you know, like uh, at least a little bit. Uh, so, you know, these days the deep learning is used as one of the de facto standards for, for understanding images and videos and so forth. And I can I'll give you some more uh, demonstration about it uh, as, as we go. Um, but so one of, it became really ap apparent that uh, this was going to be, you know, one of the dominant algorithms, at least in, in, uh, in you know, image classification and videos. 
was uh, you know through the ImageNet competition, which is you know was one of the the big recent uh, computer vision uh, challenges, right? And uh, so you know basically um, the previous year, the first few years, it was uh, mostly standard computer vision techniques. So non, I'm, I'm saying nothing related to neural networks. But then in 2011 and 12, especially, is um, there was a big advancement because uh, neural network and deep learning techniques, which are just giant neural nets, really um, trained with by propagation, so became uh, won the competition uh, by quite a large margin, actually, at the time. And after that year, uh, most of the most of the papers in that area are all using neural nets of some some sort. So what do you call deep learning? And um, especially in, in the most recent one, uh, last year of this year, it was almost all of them. Um, because, you know, the advantage was so, so obvious. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that compu computer vision is still not used. They usually combine together to, to do practical things, right? Um, but so, um, we are very excited about this field because um, it kind of surprises us on a daily basis. So I wanted to tell you, some things that I, you know, I was reading in the literature, not done by us, but <laughs> obviously by a lot of other people. And, uh, and they took me by surprise because even, even though I was familiar with neural nets and, uh, and so forth, there are some things that I didn't, I didn't think that would happen so quickly. But, but it did. So one of them was uh, um, recently they combined so the ability to analyze an image and into an ability to generate some language. Okay, this is a small text like a caption, but but still, um, the combination of you know uh, using neural network both for understanding complex data like uh, images or videos or something else, and at the same time um, using recurrent neural network to uh, to learn to to create a language model that can actually produce meaningful sentences. So you must have seen, this is some work from Google, um, you know, just uh, late last year. Um, even better, because we work in, in BioInspire Vision, so, you know, we know, we talk a lot about attention, attention in an image, you know, we don't look at parts that we don't care about, we usually care about only very specific parts, so, you know, I'm not looking at the ceiling or the floor, I know there's nothing there. I'm more focused on your faces now, and you're more focused here, maybe, or on me, right? So that's attention. And um, as this neural network were able to produce this caption, they were also able to reproduce some of this attention, visual attention mechanism that we see in humans. So, you know, as they focus on a specific object, they also focus on a specific area of the image uh, when they produce uh, that specific word. So the combination of visual attention uh, visual understanding and language was something that took me by surprise and a lot of other people in the field. Um, and more recently, uh, a recurrent neural network, which is basically just, you, you know, a uh, neural network that has feedback in time, uh, they produce also some amazing, amazing results that complement um, deep neural network, uh, the standard feed forward one that you might have heard in previous talk, even from Jan and so forth. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, um, uh, from MIT, uh, MIT work, um, they they learn to to produce to translate the text into handwritten um, uh, language, right? So the neural network was trained to to take some text and, and draw the, you know, the letter one by one, basically, sequentially. And on top of that, he learned different styles. So by changing a couple of parameters, the neural, neural network actually has some specific style of handwriting that looks very, very similar to, <laughs> to humans. So uh, you're, um, we're, we're close to see artificial documents that <laughs> are going are gonna to be scary for lawyers, I think. <laughs> Um, but even this is a pretty good accomplishment. Uh, this is a small, small test that we've, that we've done in the lab, actually, <coughs> to, to do um, language translation. Uh, so this is a really small test, just, you know, like a week of work or something. Using a recurring neural network, we train them to, to basically take as an input a sequence in one language 
and then learn to spit out the same sequence in another language. And that was done simply by, by taking some data that was, you know, in both languages and concatenating the sentences and just training the network with, the, with these couplets. And he basically learned, I mean, this is, again, it's a really simple thing, you know, not, nowhere close to state-of-the-art like Google, but it's amazing. So I, I made it, trans I'm Italian, so I made it translate from English to Italian just for fun because I knew the language. Of course, I couldn't test it. <laughs> so uh, it does make some mistake, but this is pretty, pretty damn good, you know, for just training for a day. Um, and even in, in some cases, you say, in Italian here, it says allora, it means uh, so, so what, so what, right? But ora means time or hour. And it got the sense of time, even though it didn't translate it correctly, but it's still re related. So um, the language model is pretty good, <laughs> even though it's quite simple. Um, so you might have seen also these things recently, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Google basically used this neural network to, so they showed them an image and they went through the neural network and they picked up a category that the neural network was, was able to distinguish, like dogs, you know, dog faces here. And then we went to backwards to the image and we said, okay, if I change the image slightly, how can I amplify the dogness in this image? <laughs> and so by doing this back and forth multiple times, uh, you made, they made uh, this neural network dream up images. So sort of amplify something that they see. And that's something like similar to what we do when we look at the clouds and we try to find, you know, the, an object in there. <laughs> mm. And something even even uh, more, more amazing is that they train recently, this is a variation of the previous one, but they train neural network to take in an image and then um, take in a famous painting style of different you know, famous painters. So I'm not really good with paints, but I think this is uh, Starry Night from uh, uh, Van Gogh, right? Uh, this is uh, uh, The Cry, right? The Scream, yeah. Um, I think this is some Picasso. <laughs> so what they did is basically by um, um, by going uh, back and forth through through this neural network, they um, they try to, to force the network to copy the style of the original image. So you have an original image like the Starry Night, and then he made this image look like it was similar. So, so you're looking at basically neural network dreaming images or creating images or modifying them somehow. So it, that's also quite quite uh, quite interesting, although maybe it's more for artistic purposes. Um, okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about. Um, Technology. So this, this talk is like deep learning in practice. So I actually wanted to talk, tell you about uh, application of deep learning because that's something that we're really interested these days. Into you know we have these really good algorithms. We want to really capitalize on it so that we can uh, you know push society or push push good products to society or things that are kind of really useful. So one of them would be, of course, I really like my car to drive me around. <laughs> Right, because we waste so much time, all of us, driving around where we could be reading a paper or talking to our partners, right? Um, so, and, you know, deep learning could, could help on that. Um, so this is some work from a member of the lab, Abhishek. Um, and this, this is something that we actually done also pretty, pretty quickly. You know, just a couple of weeks of work, we went out to record some videos and label them partly by hand, partly by semi-automated tools. But so here, you know, the, the neural network is trained to recognize the road uh, so that, uh, for example, you could drive autonomously on a highway. And for this task, you don't really need to identify every object in the scene. All you care about is where is the road and where are the obstacles, right? And where are my escape routes? Can I go left? Can I go right? And things like that. So we, we actually started a collaboration recently with the GM and Xilinx Automotive and uh, possibly soon with Toyota as well uh, in this area. There's a lot of interest um, in car manufacture, of course, because they have to start providing some of these things, uh, you know, pretty quickly. We're tired of driving. Other <laughs> um, other application that I see that are very important uh, you know, that I, I believe they're going to be really important is uh, some, some kind of augmented reality glass-like uh, vision. So that's basically where you give, 
give us some sort of superhuman vision where we're looking at something, but we're also connected to the internet. And so we can get uh, information about something that we care about that we wouldn't be able to otherwise, right? So it's like vision plus plus. Um, this is, um, you know, a video that I recorded uh, at home of some of the things that you could do so you can recognize the different, uh, lots of different uh, objects. This was done with our own data set. I'll talk a little bit about it later, but it's not trained on ImageNet or something public, but it's uh, something that we acquired through the company, like uh, 30 million images. Uh, it's a very, very large data set that is uh, actually related to, to home uh, and home automation. And so you can actually find things that are, you know, typical in your home, like shelves and books and so forth. But also, you, you'll see it has some performance that is amazing it's in, in some way or not because we, we've done it. But, you know, look, you can find the ceiling, and see events. You mean, no computer vision system can do these things, especially trained on standard data sets. Um, I'll show you a little demo later if we have more time. So the other... The other big application is, okay, I told you that a lot of talent has been acquired by Google, Facebook, and, and, and Twitter, and so forth, right? That was like the first wave of deep learners, right? And right now, it, they're all in the cloud. So whenever you send, you, you do some, send a picture to Google Plus or uh, upload a video on Facebook, they all get parsed with this kind of uh, algorithm, deep neural networks, to find content because Facebook wants to know who you really are. And they can only understand you if they can, you know, they, of course they understand your text to some extent, but you guys are the expert there. <laughs> um, but if you send them an image, five years ago, they didn't know what to do with it. They, if you send, if you really like cars uh, and you send a bunch of pictures of cars, they didn't have a way to infer that you like cars unless you wrote something about cars. Right now they can. So now you send cars; they can advertise for cars to you. And not only they can advertise for that specific car that you really like. So brand and color and so forth. So it's quite pervasive. <laughs> um, and then you know, so we developed a similar, uh, similar in the company Teradip. We developed a similar cloud uh, processing system where we can. Um, we have this neural network in the cloud. You can send images or videos, and we can tag them. Um, again, I can show you uh, a little a little demo in a in a few um, in a few minutes. Um, the other thing that we 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 were doing is sort of in the company that started from work in um, uh, at Purdue was the work for home automation. So making uh, cameras smart so that they could. Security cameras, you know, like the one down there. Okay, like that's probably not a security camera. <laughs> that's just a video conference. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, these cameras up to today, they still just record video, send it up to the cloud or somewhere, and then you have to go and look at hours and hours of video, and good luck, right, finding things. Uh, so what we, what we developed, you know, was, uh, was a system. This is actually... In, installed in uh, the front of my house that could actually only detect when a person is present. So only person. Of course, we can actually do any category, right? But person is really important one for home automation or security camera because usually it's people that cause problems. But I could have trained it to do, you know, to detect raccoons. So here, if I have a problem of raccoons <laughs> riding, you know, my, my garbage, which we actually do, <laughs> Uh, then I could find out which raccoon it is, but uh, yeah. <laughs> then what do I do? I can recognize them. <laughs> um, we also worked heavily, so this is um, uh, Alfredo and John Horn, I'll, I'll point them out later, but we worked heavily on, uh, on face identification. So face, face identification with deep neural network actually has better performance than humans these days. So we replicated some of uh, um, the most, uh, most recent work. Um, and this is how you put them together, for example, for a home automation project. So, you know, it would find the person and then when it gets close, uh, you know, enough to get your face, then it can also identify who that person is. Um, and this is, this is not manufactured video, this is actually a real video from, from one of our tests. Um, okay, so 
this was just to give you an introduction about the field. And now, you know, in the rest of the time, I wanted to tell you a little bit about deep network, deep neural network, what we do for hardware, uh, how we train them, and how we can scale, scale deployments. And if you find something interesting for collaboration, please talk to us after. <laughs> um, so really, uh, you know, our goal, long-term goal in research was to sort of replicate uh, visual capabilities of the brains in, in algorithms, right? Um, that is done. So this is where deep neural network came came along. Uh, you know, this, this is work that was done also 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it started with uh, the, the first generation of a neural network, right? In Fukushima, but it's only very recently, and uh, I think it's 2000 and four or, or so that really like lots of people pushed in, in different directions. So this is work from Tommaso Poggiot and MIT that was going through the, was trying to make model of the, the visual cortex. Uh, and so this is, it's called HMAX. Um, it has a multi, multiple layer of uh, feature extractor that would extract, you know, would go from small group of pixels to, to larger group of pixels and so forth. And the idea was to create a hierarchical system that would find edges and combine edges into squares and combine squares and circles into sh other shapes. You know, that was the, the whole idea, uh, which is very similar to what we know uh, from neuroscience about our vision system. Although our neuroscience tools are still pretty crude to really understand what happens, you know, after the first few layers, because it's just, we don't really have the scientific methods to do that. Um, but, okay, that's fine. We can make computer simulation, you know, that approximate uh, what we know. So that's where they really started. Um, so it really all started from, from neural networks. I don't know if you remember. I mean, I was, they, they taught me neural network when I was in, in college not so long ago, and, you know, just a few few things about them. <laughs> uh, neural networks are just a simple uh, general function approximator where you can, um, they're approximated by, by small uh, nonlinear units that, um, that take um, input from other units, they sum them together, and then they multiply them by, by some weight. Well, first they multiply each by some weight, which is your memory. Uh, then they sum them together, and then it goes through a nonlinearity so that you can have, you know, nonlinear operation between uh, different layers. Otherwise, it would all collapse to a giant, just one layer, right, if you didn't have nonlinearity. And so a neural network are, you know, at the beginning, they were really good for uh, distinguishing, you know, separating data. So in this case, you know, you want to separate this, the blue data from the red data, and it's obviously not linearly separable. Uh, but the neural network can figure out a function like this hyperbolic uh, that um, that can separate the data. And then if you look at what one of these hidden layer does, you can see that actually what it did is it, it tries to, to morph the data in a, in a way that it's linearly separable. So the combination of lots of linearly separable unit and nonlinearity gives you some nonlinear uh, function that uh, you know, it's op hopefully what you want. Uh, in terms of vision, this means that I want this neural network to take my image and to do something with the image. Like most of the examples that I showed you were classification. So, you know, one out of n possible object, right? Uh, but there could be other things that you, you want to do, like anomaly detection. I know you guys work a lot on that. And, um, uh, that's you know might be a little bit harder to do with these things. I don't. I'm not sure. I know how to do it <laughs> right now. <coughs> so, but deep neural network is if, if uh, this is a small neural network with uh, you know three layers and three uh, uh, input values and two output values. Okay, but um, the the deep network that we use today. So this is one of the largest actually. Uh, it's one of the the monsters <laughs> in our <laughs> field. Uh, it's called VGG network. It takes the whole image. An image could be, for most of these networks, are usually around 250 by 250, so lots of pixels, right? 500,000 pixels or so. Um, and instead of you doing one by one, um, you know, connection to the last layer, it, it does convolutions. So it looks at a group of, 
of pixels and it learns the weight to sort of combine information from a group of pixels. So <coughs> the input is pixel level. It's not you don't do anything on feature edge or segment. No, no, nothing. Yeah, it's okay. pure purely what comes from the camera, RGB data. I mean it could be YUV, it could be any color space really. <coughs> Usually we deal with RGB. So each pixel is three dollars. Yes, yes. So yeah, you come in with the free free maps sort of neural maps and those get combined into the next layer here 64 um, in various ways <coughs> uh, so actually it looks complicated but it's, it's actually not that complicated this the this deep neural network fairly simple uh, all you're doing is you're doing a bunch of convolution to go to the next layer which is similar to what you do here but instead of doing one by one instead of taking only one pixel I take a group of pixels so it's, that's all there is. Um, you do a, a bunch of convolution, then you do max pooling, which means that I take four pixels and I combine them into one, right? And uh, and then you have a threshold operation, which is a non-linearity. The simplest case could be if the value is below zero, set it to zero, and if it's above one, set it to the value. You know, so it's like a threshold function, just to make it non-linear so it wouldn't collapse into a giant linear model, right? Um, and then at the end you have fully connected layer. These are fully connected layers, so it's like a standard neural net. It's just ginormous. It has a lot of parameters and lots of maps, and it takes a lot of computation to do it. It's big, but it's not as big as our the one in our brain. Our brain is probably, you know, at least a thousand times bigger. <laughs> at least in sheer number of neurons, because we don't really know how it's organized very well. Right? Um, so convolution are done like this. So for ev every layer, you take the input, you convolve it by a filter of weights. These are all learned weights that the neural network you know, is, has to be trained for. And then they, they combine and they create an output pixel in, the, in one of the outputs. In this case, there are 64. Uh, and here we have yeah 64 maps of 220 by 220, let's say, in this case. Oh. The threshold is quite simple, so you do well, element, uh, element-wise uh, threshold. So you know that's the, the, you know that's what I was telling you before. So if it's below zero zero, otherwise it's identity. Um, so pixel by pixel. In max pooling, it just takes uh, a group of pixels here, four pixels, for example, and, and finds the maximum of those pixels and copies them. Uh, why the maximum? I don't know if you ever tried to get um, this vector graphics drawing that have a very thin line, right? And if you try to downsample them, if you, were, if you were not doing the max, the little line would disappear because it would be average with the... Uh, with, um, with the neighbor that are zero. But um, instead, if you do max pooling, you're actually preserving that information. Even though it, it was one line, when you resize it down, it's still one line because it was the max in that area. So it, it makes sense to do max because you want to, you want to keep the information that the network thought it was the most interesting, the max. Right? <clears throat> Um, and you know this is another version of of that is this is how um, one layer looks like so you can have an image it gets convolved by multiple filter the filter in the first layer looks something like this um, and then you subsample you reduce by two and then you go to a nonlinearity which makes sort of the image look saturated right um, I can show you a little demo because you know a lot of you will say oh, okay but what do these things really learn and what's going on inside a lot of people are, are you know are saying okay you you train this neural net but you have no clue what it's doing <laughs> well okay there's two there's two things uh, to say about that first of all these are really complex systems so it's very hard for a human to really understand exactly what goes on at every <laughs> every little um, you know, unit because there's just too many parameters. And on top of that, you really don't want to go fiddle with each one of them manually, right? It will take your whole life to do it. So you, you really want it to learn by itself. The problem is, is it learning what, what I want or not, right? Um, 
So this is. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, uh, so I, there's a, they're on the order of parameters. VGG, ten millions. Yeah. Okay. I know. It. Yeah, ten millions. <laughs> they say. Um, these are trainable parameters, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, reality in units is a lot bigger, so. It could be several billion billion units, right? Okay. Anyway, this is work by Heise, who was was the, there in the audience. She did like a little visualization tool that I thought was quite quite interesting. So I wanted to show you, you know, what the neural network sees um, if everything works. <laughs> so this is camera input from here. Uh, no, from my computer. I'm sorry. And these are sort of the the first layer. Uh, filters. What you might wanna uh, want, might wanna figure out is so this is like an horizontal horizontal uh, uh, line detector. If we go down to sort of one of the last layers, um, and we see, you see it's fairly active here in this this area. So if I click on it, it shows what activates it. It's like my neck area. It's activating it for some reason. It learned. You know, he learned from examples, lots of examples, that the neck area was important to, you know, distinguish some things. This network was trained on ImageNet, by the way. It's not our network. This is, um, I think, it's Kun's network. Uh, but there's other other unit that learned something about face, so they respond to, to face somehow. See. How are you visualizing So these are. This is. That yeah. Come yeah. And then you're showing the output that's in the and then you're saying that's the part that's activated through the inputs that you use to output. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, we just look at the output. This is one of the outputs, the output layer and classification, right? And then we can go back into the network and say what yeah, what part of the image really made you active, right? Uh, so we can do different things. I don't know, this is a hand uh, there might be different. Uh, this is sensitive to sort of uh, this horizontal pattern like this, you know. And so we have we basically have tools to that allow you to really understand exactly what goes on, and then you can figure out, you know, did he learn the right things for my task, or uh, should I, should I change the data? Most of the things, the actionable. Um, the things that you can learn from these visualization tools is that really that you can f figure out whether your data was good enough for the task or not, you know. But at least you know what what features did he learn? Did he learn to de decompose the image and find the features of my image, or was why was he getting confused and so forth? <clears throat> so uh, these uh, deep neural networks. Um, oh, the questions. Yeah. What is the specific response for the train? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So this is, you know, this is a tool that allows you to understand what your network learned. Like if you, you know, if you're interested in. Um, Making it detect cars, for example, you want to make sure that it has some units that detect wheel, um, you know, wheels or uh, rims. Uh, so you can go and, and see whether he actually learned this, and why is getting confused between car and bicycles. Um, and then you can, based on this information, you can modify your data set and retrain, right? <clears throat> I think the asking. Oh. For the green you're showing us, what Oh, this was trained on ImageNet. This is um, a standard network um, that uh, is public from Jan um, Overfit. And, and that was just to identify like, what tags were in the images, or every image has one? Yeah, this is like a thousand categories uh, from ImageNet, dogs, uh, lots of, you know, lots of things. It didn't have humans or cars, but... 
yeah, it's just that, you know, I wanted to show you that in reality you can go and figure out exactly what your network is doing, mm -hmm. you know. You can go to every single neuron and see what effect it has, right? The question is how, you know, can you translate that information efficiently to, <laughs> to do what you, what you want to do? Um, so, so this deep neural network um, are mostly trained on, on, on data. So in this case, we train them on, on large quantity of images. And these images are a lot, lots of images. Lots of them. And then uh, the training is usually uses some version of stochastic gradient descent, um, you know, to find that the maximum, the op optimal uh, weights so that you can classify all the image in your data set properly, basically. I'll talk a little bit more about training later. Um, but, you know, it's, um, the bottom line is that you, you're feeding them some images and you're going through the network in a forward forward pass, and then you compute. Uh, the network is gonna say, okay, you show an image of a car, but it says it's a dog. Uh, from that, the output of the network, I can, I can, I can get a f sort of an error f function, right? And I try to to minimize this error basically, and that's called the you know an error comes from the cr the criterion. The criterion is. Uh, a mathematical formula that decides what you want the network to do, you know, specifically. So I'll give you an example of a criterion that is quite simple to understand. Um, a face identification. So usually you, you might have uh, a, a new picture of a face and what you want to find out is whether did it match the, you know, one of the identities that I have or not, meaning are, is this uh, the distance between these two images uh, closer than the distance between these two? And that's what you want to, that's the criterion that you want to create, to force really. You want to say, okay, if it's the same person, the image obviously look very different, <laughs> but if it's the same person, I want the network to, to group them together, so to, to create an embedding, you know, at the output of the network, so which is just a vector. I want that vector to be close, you know, I want similar faces to be close uh, in space together, but I want a different face to be far apart from that group, so I want to separate them like this, right? And uh, uh, if you implement, this is like a, a triplet loss that it's used by uh, the state-of-the-art the Google system actually to do face identification. Uh, so we, uh, jong -un and Alfredo that are here in the audience actually reproduce the system, the system from Google uh, that actually have, believe it or not, above human performance. In, in this data set, um, LFW, they were able to, to get more than 98% uh, recognition. Uh, I forgot how many categories there are in that data set. Several, there's lots of, <laughs> you know, several tens of thousands. But what we, what we did is that they train it on, uh, they train it on a much larger data set. It's about half a million, the Casia data set that had, I don't know how many identities, 10,000? 16,000. 16,000 faces, right? And, uh, and, they, and then they tested on, on LFW, which it's another data set, but it doesn't have enough training sample, <laughs> but it's used to test, you know, but mostly by academic and, and, uh, and companies. Um, Called yeah, this. Uh, so you always use an incongruous pair in there. Well, it's so it's I, trained. Imagine yeah. a lot of sense you want those two things to be as close together. Yes. But I can't figure out how you improve it. It's trained by it's trained with the, with the strip uh, with free images mm -hmm. all the time. We give free com free different combination of images. But when you use it, so actually creates uh, an embedding about the face, right? And so when you use it, you don't have to send three images. You can send just one image and get that embedding. And then we can, you know, let's say you give me five images of yours and a few images of mine. Then the, the embedding, all your images will be close together in space. And all mine will be close in space. Because they learn from all these other faces how to separate us, right? Mm -hmm. And then later what you do is you go and, and check if I have a new image of just saying, for example, is embedding, you check whether it matches, it's close to, 
one of yours or it's close to one of mine or it's close to something else. Right? If it's far away from both, then we say it's, it's unknown because we didn't have this category. So, so we don't have to, it's, it's more about uh, you know, linearly, well not linear, but separating them in space and, um, and then looking at similarity. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm, I'm still not a big expert in recurrent neural network. I'm studying them as probably some of you. <laughs> um, but what the recurrent neural network is, it, it became very popular recently after uh, deep neural nets and, uh, and this convolutional neural network, or, or they're called. Um, it's, it's just, a, again, it, it's a neural network like the, the, the little one that I showed you before, but now it has an extra, ex extra variable. Um, that it, you know, it can it can remember some things through time. So it has a connection through time, right? So it, it, it evolves over time, just like a sentence or voice or a video, right? It evolves through time, and it can memorize sequences basically. Um, and the way you can unroll it like this. So this is like uh, well, the network looked at instant zero, how it looked at instant one. We looked at instant two and so forth, and what you see that it has, it has a connection here be, be, between you know how it looked previously and how it looks now. So it's like a memory system, really, right? Um, and it was very hard. I mean, there's been a lot of research in in this area, and it was uh, it was very hard to train them, mostly because they wouldn't be able to remember things for very long. They would, you know, a lot of their gradient vanished, and they they had like a short memory loss, <laughs> in a way, because of the train training techniques. Uh, but recently, uh, Schmidt Zuber, well, it's not that recent, you know, not that recent. I think it's like ten years ago. It's probably before, uh, yeah, before deep learning was even popular. He was already working on these things, and uh, he figured out a way, um, um, a, a special to have a special cell called LSTM. Uh, so long, short term memory, right? It's a special cell that it's a slightly more sophisticated neuron, <laughs> okay, with gating that can uh, be trained to to remember sequences. And now you can actually with this LSTM you can you can learn very long sequences. You, before you had a problem, you know, if you were going above ten step time steps, this one can can generate quite long time steps. I don't know exactly you know, what the, the limitation is, but I know that it can go several hundreds of, of steps at several thousand at least from experiments, right? And the, the way it does this is basically, again, here it's like imagine this as a combination of neurons, but each neuron is gating, is gating inputs. So it can gate the input, so it can decide is the input at this time step important for me or not? Or you can decide whether the memory that you accumulated is important at the time step or not, right? Um, and you can decide whether it wants to produce an output or not at, at every single step. And all these are learned gating parameters. So if there's a weight corresponding to each one of these things. So when it translates, for example, when I was showing you the example of translation, it was, uh, it was you know, first memorizing the sentence, and then at a certain point when, when it saw end of, end of uh, sentence in Italian, it would say, oh, okay, now I need, I need to start spinning out things. So it would remember the whole sentence and produce the first letter in the other language. Now, this was a character-based training, actually. Um, so, so yeah, these this new recurrent neural networks are, are very popular and uh, they, they're allowing us to, to, really, um, to, to really learn the complex sequences uh, these days. So you'll, you'll see them in, in the news on, uh, on article uh, quite often. And I showed you a few examples. Um, we, still have to, we still have to work heavily on it, so we are, we are ramping up to use them, but not yet. <laughs> um, Okay, so I guess I have how much, you know, a few minutes? Five minutes, okay. Sorry, I'm keeping you long. Uh, so a lot of the, the work that we've been doing um, in the past 
uh, beside algorithms is uh, is ardor for deep learning. So if you want to run these algorithms uh, you know, on a server, basically you have multi two options these days. You know, either you run them on your on your CPU or you run them on some kind of GPU. And these days it's more and more GPUs. Um, and um, we worked on on another kind of hardware, our own version of hardware that would be very efficient and more efficient than what what you can do today with the GPU or CPU. Um, and we used FPGA. FPGAs are programmable logic array. Basically, they're like uh, um, you know you can build the circuit out of code. Basically, that's what it is. So you can you can tell you know connect this transistor like this, this other transistor like that. You can build your own processor that's what we did and uh, so so this is uh, the what we think uh, the the current generation this is the, the the lighter color are the the current generation number three can do in terms of images per second and this is what uh, the generation four that is under you know is being worked out can do so we are able to to do on a, on a small FPGA that consumes about 5 to 10 watts. We can do the same amount of computation that you have on a large NVIDIA GPU that consumes more than 300 watts. Uh, basically, that's the point. Uh, I don't want, I cannot go into too much details, but uh, a lot of the work of NNX, the second and third generation, was done by Bering that is here in the audience. And Vinay is working on, on a new version that uh, um, uses a, a more uh, more simplified uh, cores, let's call them cores, which are Mac units, multiply accumulate units, to just increase efficiency. Um, and um, you know, our goal is to design a system system on a chip to do these things. Um, the system on a chip will be able to do. Um, you know more than more than um, uh, similar to what the current GPU can do, but at very very small amount of watts. Uh, and this is like a performance in terms of uh, uh, trillion operations per watt compared to standard hardware. Um, actually, it's not like I didn't I forgot to plot the standard hardware. It's just that <laughs> their performance is so small that you don't see them in this graph. So we basically. Will, if we if we can make this chip, we'll blow them away, hopefully. Um, all right, yeah. So um, I, a lot of deep learning is really uh, just lots of data, <laughs> lots of data, and having you know good good models and uh, and good architectures. But you know, I say you know it's like for buying a house, it's location, location, location. For us, it's data, data, data. I would say. You want lots of it relevant, you know, whole possible classes. It's better to train for, for a million classes than to just train for two, even though you were just going to use these two. Um, we, we accumulated more than 32 million images through the company, through a partnership. So that's like more than 30 times what, um, what you find in a public data set. And the model is key, but really, we think the data is king. <laughs> if you have the data, you can do things. <laughs> yeah. Can you go back to your statement? Sort of slid that in there that you should use a lot of classes. Oh yeah, if you yeah. Only want really yes. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or? Yeah. It's just that, especially for images, um, the more classes you have, the more you force the network to really divide. The space and recognize different things. So even though, even though you might not use these classes, like we in our product we use, we just find people, but we actually train for thousands of objects uh, that are in the home because by doing that we become the person detector becomes a lot stronger than if we were to group all the other categories into something. Because if I group all the other cat categories into something else. The network is trying to group all these different things together, and then it, you know, it doesn't find, doesn't do the right job to separate them. I, I leave this to the more <laughs> theoretical minds, I think, to prove. But, <laughs> but this is like practical insights. <clears throat> so I had another question now about the yeah. structure of the models because yeah. you know you showed us something with like you know mm -hmm. millions and billions of parameters. Does 
anybody ever take the time to go back and say, like, reconsider those structures and say, hey, maybe we didn't need... Oh, yes, yeah, sure, like sure, sure. Maybe we only needed 10,000. Like, yes, zero. yes, yes. Yeah, so actually, the structure looks complicated, but it's really not. Usually, they're like fully connected layers. So all you decide is how many maps I want in each layer. And yeah, people experiment all the time squeezing this layer, that layer, but they found this right combination, you know, started with this Alex net and then overfit and then there's this VGG network. There's another Google network that is has branches and it's slightly better on ImageNet, but for practical purposes, they're, you're, they're right there, you know, <laughs> they're fairly similar. So in the but, visualization that you showed us when mm -hmm. you were looking at the camera and you were showing us what was activated, a lot of those just look completely black. Like, so, so those little cells, yeah, right. like they weren't being used at all. So when I see that, I yes. think, well, there's parts of the model that are... That's true, yes. Uh, well, okay. Yes. Okay, so there's this concept of sparsity, even in our brain, and people say, you know, we only use 5% of the brain, right? And what, what they mean is exactly that. It's actually, we have tons of neurons, but they're not always active. Because um, you're trying to, I mean, we're kind of trying to compress the space from millions of, of possibilities. Actually, it's two to the number of pixels, so it's a ginormous number. You're going to, um, well, it's not two, it's number of classes to to the power of number of pixels. So it's a huge number. You're going down to, uh, you're trying to logarithmically compress uh, this data, right, at every layer. Um, but <clears throat> but and, and if you do that, um, you have to use some, you're going to get some sparsity in, uh, in the networks because, you know, it tries to differentiate between, it tries to use one neuron to, to find very specific things and not others. Right, um, and so in, in in the middle in the middle it's actually at the beginning of the network is not very is not very sparse because it's using all of them. But when you go down, I showed you actually the last the last layer. In that case, actually trained uh, it wants you it wants to have only one class active because you are training it that way. You're forcing them to classify, right? Um, but there are even the previous layer are quite sparse. And maybe, you know, it has to do with this classification. Uh, and it, it also related to this. So when you, if you train network to do classification and uh, you need data that is labeled and you get some result, but we are actually trained with, um, you know, as humans, we're trained with unlabeled data and you will be seldom given a label, right? When you grow up, your dad says, oh, that's a dog. Then you would follow the dog and next time you would remember, right? So we actually only get just a few instances uh, of, you know, supervision. And right now, instead, we're doing the opposite with this network because we're trying to train them really fast, you know, within a week um, in our lab. Then we give them lots of lots of supervision. But label data is very costly because somebody has to go and label, <laughs> label it all. If we could use unlabeled data, then it would be great. And so most of the field is trying to figure out how to make unlabeled data work. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so when you are look, looking at other classes versus, let's say, training over humans, yeah. would it be useful to randomly generate something that you know is not a human and that use that as also part of the training? Oh, you mean uh, artificial? Yeah, yeah artificial. Ger generate artificial images. Okay, so I know that there was some effort in the past to do mm -hmm. that. But um, the problem is you, your generation method have, have to have exactly the same statistics of natural scenes. If you screw up, it won't work it, because it will it'll be trained on some artificial data that has nothing to do with reality. So in, it's been very hard to do that, like create. I think now that we have these really cool video games, they all look realistic, you know, these really good graphics, maybe there's a way. And in fact, I know there was a company a few years ago that was trying to do exactly that. But I haven't heard any success in that area. I think it has to do again with the problem of you really have to have the same. It has to look really real. And, and cameras are cheap. We get cameras everywhere. So, you know, we can take videos easily. It's most. <laughs> but you're right. That would solve the problem of labor. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Sorry to. I went over a little bit. But 
again, we're looking for friends and collaborations and or people that might be even the student part-time that might want to work, you know, on practical things uh, for the company. I mean. <laughs> or, um, yeah, or any suggestion or anything. Thanks for coming. Yeah. While you go away, um, I can run the demo here <laughs> in, in this uh, in the room. This was trained with our, this is not trained on ImageNet, it's trained with our super giant data set. So it actually has things that you don't, you don't find, you know, see. see. So when you put these percentages, that's showing the five classes that have the highest Yeah, yeah, yes. But they don't always add to 100%. No, no, no. This, there's a thousand of them here, so yeah, the probability is like, you know, you can Well, so if it was really certain to be like a wall, then that might probability Yeah, yes, if it really looks like a training. Yeah. Then it's, Something else. This.